This uh, session that we're kicking off is called uh, It's Time, uh, How the Country Was Won in 1972. And I think in a sense, as you all know, it's what we've been speaking about for uh, during this entire uh, symposium today. Our plan for this particular session is uh, a little different to the others. Uh, it's going to be a little less uh, formal. We'll have some uh, brief introductory comments uh, from Paul. We may even have some from Laura at some stage. And, um, and then we'll have uh, a conversation on, um, on uh, uh, issues and questions that uh, I hope you find uh, enjoyable and interesting, and I also hope uh, that uh, many of you will be engaged in that conversation uh, as well. So to to kick things off, uh, uh, our, I'm going to throw to uh, to uh, Paul Kelly. As you know, Paul's the uh, editor at large of the uh, Australian newspaper. Uh, without question, uh, a very very a uh, distinguished Australian writer uh, and uh, commentator and particularly uh, they really, I, I think he's written more extensively uh, and with more authority than anyone on the last uh, 50 years of Australian politics. So over to you, Paul. Uh, well, thanks, John, and thanks for that very generous introduction. Look, it's a, it's a delight and a thrill for me to be here today at this Whitlam Institute event, uh, reflecting on on Gough Whitlam and the events of 1972. And it's a particular thrill, John, to have you, a long-standing friend, chair this. And uh, I might also say, in anticipation of Laura's arrival, it's great to be. <laughs> sharing uh, a panel uh, with Laura, another long-standing friend and colleague. Uh, Gough Whitlam is one of my most favourite Prime Ministers and he did have a big influence on my life. I was lucky enough as a young, perhaps a very young, political correspondent to cover the Whitlam government and it was part of the education process. I mean, travelling overseas with Gough as Prime Minister, I said once, was like travelling with the Encyclopaedia Britannica. <laughs> Gough would provide a highly accurate and very lengthy rundown of the history of whatever country we were visiting in terms of uh, politics, culture and society. And uh, dealing with Gough uh, for those remarkable years, was a great thrill. He was a Prime Minister dealing with the media um, uh, of great insight. He was always entertaining. He was great fun. Um, even when he was angry, and he was angry uh, as time went on during that three-year period, he was always compelling. Um, he did have a big influence on my life. Covering the Whitlam government in its triumphs and its flaws led me to think through the principles that would govern my approach to politics and journalism subsequently. So looking at the Whitlam government, I'd make a few introductory comments about Gough. I think that Gough is seen, and look, I think we can have a grand entrance at this point. <laughs> I did say, Laura, you weren't going to be deliberately two minutes late, that uh, I promise you, I promise you. <laughs> and of Paul's course, just, just kicking off. And of course, all the complimentary things I said about Laura, I said in her absence. <laughs> So she'll never know exactly what they were. Um, so in terms of making a few preliminary comments about Gough, I do think that he was historically indispensable and I appreciate this is a highly dubious concept. But if we look at his election to the Labor leadership, 
in February 1967. It was a field comprising Jim Cairns, Frank Crean, Fred Daly and Kim Beasley. I doubt any of them would have won the 1972 election. Uh, I knew them all well. And I think given the state of the party that Gough inherited, the idea that any one of those other potential leaders could have delivered what was required to take the party to government in 1972 is a remote idea. The McMahon government was weak, but there were profound obstacles to a Labor victory in that previous seven or eight years. Labor had lost eight elections on the trot, the DLP remained strong, and Australia was a very conservative country. So I put on the table the idea that Whitlam was historically indispensable in the return of Labor to power. Second point I want to make is Whitlam as saviour. Whitlam didn't just improve the Labor Party, he didn't just reform the Labor Party, he didn't just democratise sections of the Labor Party. I think he saved the Labor Party. And in the famous and great speech he made in the Victorian Conference, I think in 1968, he put the issue up in light directly, saying the question was whether the Labor Party would remain a coherent force that was able to form a national government in this country or not. And that, I think, was the correct proposition. That was the real challenge, whether Labor would remain a relevant force capable of governing again. So great was the Labor crisis. Labor at that stage was an ageing, weak, factional, old-fashioned party, really decoupled to a great extent from much of the Australian community. So I think the idea of Whitlam as saviour is important. My next proposition is Whitlam as moderniser. Whitlam transformed the outlook, the identity and the policy framework of the Labor Party. And we saw that if we look at the agenda that changed when he was opposition leader and then what happened during the Whitlam government. So he appealed to a middle class base in addition to Labor's traditional working class voters. He was committed to uh, action in terms of sexual and racial equality, campaigning for the end of white Australia, uh, committed to transforming educational policies at school and tertiary level, had a particular commitment to youth, women, migrants, Indigenous Australians and a commitment to Indigenous land rights. He was committed to the embryonic environmental movement and had a vision for that in relation to labour, a more independent foreign policy, uh, a vision for arts and culture, uh, as Kim has just outlined, uh, opposition to the Vietnam War and conscription. This was a transformation in the Labor agenda. The Whitlam legacy remains as a live force in Labor today. You cannot understand the Labor Party today without going back and looking at the Whitlam agenda and the Whitlam heritage. My next point is Whitlam had a vision of national government in this country. And it was his vision of national government that led to his vision for the Labor Party. Whitlam understood government, parliament and the constitution. He recognised that socialism and nationalisation was an obsolete concept. He devised a new vision for Labor in government based on a highly interventionist national government that used its financial powers to improve the lot of the Australian people through a centralised approach to national government, whether we're talking now about health, education, welfare, the cities, regional development. We all understand this long list. But the long list came from Goff's vision of national government. I think this is an enormously important point, and of course it was reflected in the famous 1972 policy speech written by Graham Freudenberg. This speech was magnificent, it was lofty, it was utopian, it was naive, 
It was understandable at the time. It was a blueprint for government and it contained the seeds of Labor's failure, given that the ambition and spending, of course, would coincide in a way Whitlam didn't understand at the time with a new period of rising international and domestic inflation and stagflation. And of course, it was in February 1973, two months after Whitlam won the election, that we see the Treasury warning the incoming government that it's got to curb its spending program for inflationary purposes. So here we see the paradox, of course, between the Whitlam vision in the 72 policy speech and the challenge that the government faced in economic terms. My final point is the Whitlam persona. Well, we could say so much about this, couldn't we? But Whitlam looked like a prime minister. He talked like a prime minister. He acted like a prime minister in a party whose previous leaders had been Arthur Cole and Doc Evatt. And Whitlam's persona was very important, not just in inspiring a lot of activists and people committed to the Labor cause, but reassuring a lot of the Australian public that this Labor leader who looked like a Prime Minister was a safe bet in terms of how they voted the 1972 election. And of course, the 1972 election was only a modest victory. So the Whitlam persona was important in terms of gathering the votes, but also sending a message that undermined the concept of the born to rule perception of the Liberals. Thanks, John. Thanks so much, Paul. And uh, our, again, just to make a, a brief opening uh, statement, um, um, just invite Laura to do that. I'm sure you all realise that uh, Laura is also one of uh, uh, this uh, nation's uh, leading journalists, commentators and writers on politics. Currently, of course, the chief, chief political correspondent of the 7.30 report. What did I say? The 7.30 report. Oh, 7.30, that's right. 7 full point 30, yeah. But I'm a very old person. You've got to take... You just take account of those things, um, Laura. 7.30, and here she is to speak to you. Don't you just love a pedant? Um, but I, I still get it wrong after four years. Um, look, thank you very much for including me today. Um, of course, my opening declaration is that I was in year six at Artaman Public School in 1972, so, um, which I pointed out to Faulkner when he invited me along today. Um, and as a result, I suppose what I would like to reflect on is what I'd call the half-life of the Whitlam election in 1972, which uh, for many reasons that Paul's talked about continue to just resonate through the way our politics works. Um, possibly not in the ways, um, you know, I mean, in the, in the grand ways that um, Kelly's talked about, but also in other ways as well, I think. Um, looking at some of the things I was just thinking about today, if you think about campaigning, um, uh, what do people remember now of the 1972 campaign? Um, well, I'm, su I'm suspecting a lot of you probably do remember this, this, the famous speech, but most people would probably remember a bit of faded black and white footage of a television ad and a slogan, some really horrible yellow T-shirts. <laughs> um, but the point is, if we were alive, we'd remember some, something about it. How much do we remember about subsequent campaigns? Um, something about turning on the lights or was it leaving them on? I can't remember. Um, Reconciliation, recovery, and re reconstruction. I prefer not to remember. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's stick together. The answer is liberal. One of my all-time favourites. <laughs> uh, Bob Hawke for Australia's future. Uh, fight back um, for all of us uh, versus leadership. Um, 
Now, of course, <laughs> I was laughing to myself because I was thinking I can't remember what the 2022 election slogans were um, and uh, the only one I could come up with was Stronger Economy, Stronger Future, which was the Labor one, uh, versus It Won't Be Easy Under Albanese. Um, now, they, they are all pretty dull, let's face it, um, and they, they don't sort of count too much. Somebody else could. Um, but what I suppose I'd echo in some ways what um, Kelly's talked about. To me, my half-life memory of the 1972 campaign and how it reflects what we have demanded of our subsequent leaders is that Gough was this charismatic figure. Um, he, he did have an ambitious agenda. He had an advertising campaign. He had a slogan and a song. Now, I can't remember if there were slogans and songs before 1972, but I'm thinking there probably wasn't really, was it? Um, anybody? No. Um, we don't still have slogans and songs, but we did have them for a long time. He was endorsed by communities that hadn't really entered the political fray before, particularly the arts community. And, of course, there was the nature of the campaigning. Um, and I think both the campaign and the government have gone on to reflect um, and, and sort of had this distant echo in campaigns ever since. For example, um, I think it is still the case that Labor carries um, the burden, if you like, of the way uh, of that 1973 uh, oil shock and um, that still, and you can see it in the budget, and in the way that Jim Chalmers is preparing for the budget next Tuesday, there is still this great sense we have to look like we're credible economic managers. But going back to the campaign and Goff himself, um, he did look like a leader. Um, uh, Paul compared him with previous Labor leaders, but it, it's an issue, I think, that that has sort of kept going ever since, that... People want a Prime Minister to look like a Prime Minister and that's counted against a few people we could mention. Um, th they wanted an ambitious agenda or if they didn't get an ambitious agenda, they sort of felt a bit badly done by. Um, now, I think th the one thing that has changed which had nothing to do with Goff is television. Um, it was really only in its political infancy um, in 1972 in terms of politics. The Channel 9 Bureau in Parliament House did not open until 1975. Um, commercial television didn't cover federal politics in, the, in those days. So it was very different. And that's obviously, more than anything else, I think changed the nature of campaigning to the sort of fairly fatuous stuff we see most days now. Um, just going through some of Paul's points and then I'll shut up. Um, he, uh, I, I'm not going to comment about um, all the things that Goff did and um, didn't do because they were all very splendid and um, Paul's spelt them out, but I was asked to just reflect on this issue of, of the way uh, the campaign has echoed down through time and it is in things like um, this, the point that Paul makes about national government. Um, I mean, that if you think about Fraser and Hawke in particular, the way those agendas of those um, Prime Ministers were different and so much more ambitious in what they were trying to achieve than I think people who preceded uh, Whitlam, um, it, it showed that he had entrenched those ideas uh, and, and really changed the way both sides of politics had to play politics. And even in Labor's failings, as I said, um, that was that had its seeds in that speech. Um, they still echo in the way politics is conducted now. Thanks so much, Laura. And yes, we did have a slogan in uh, 1969. It was "Swing to Labor," and a lot of people did. But it, it, the the real story was not quite enough, and that would have made a very big difference if uh, a few more had done so. But. Um, Picking up on what you're both saying, I wonder if it's worth us having a, 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 ha making a comment on what I think is the stark difference between Goff's approach 
to the importance and development of policy and what, of course, and it was so significant, the work that went in, the resources, the use of the parliament and so forth that we've talked about in this symposium today, the difference between the emphasis and importance Gough gave policy development and what is effectively the modern practice of politics where it simply doesn't, to me, it simply doesn't seem to matter so much. And um, I was wondering, Paul, if you believe that that's, um, the, the, the differences there are very stark. Well, I think they are, John. I mean, Gough was a parliamentarian in, in the authentic sense. He didn't just pay lip service to the parliament. He saw the parliament as the instrument that would transform Australia and believed that a Labor government would use the parliament to do that, and that had all sorts of consequences. Gough was an educator. I mean, I said in my opening comments... <laughs> He played a role, I think, in educating me, spending time with him and travelling with him. He, by instinct, was an educator. Um, and he had a vision for the country, a vision based in a program, a policy framework. He was so attached to the policy framework that occasionally he would get incredibly boring because he would go on and on and on about a particular aspect of policy. I think everyone would agree with you, Paul, but some would say it wasn't occasional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can, remember, I can remember being at Miranda Shopping Centre one evening during a, a really dynamic Labor rally and Goff going on and on and on about the referendums. And all these uh, people had come out, you know, committed Labor supporters and so on, and Goff wasn't giving them any red meat at all. He was just educating them about, about, the, about the referendums. That'd be far so, better than railway gauges, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, well, yes, certainly, certainly. But anyway, this, this, of course, is all part of the nature of Whitlam, and, of course, this goes to uh, the essence of his approach, which is that you want to win government putting forward a detailed and specified reform agenda. Now, that was a great Whitlam strength, but it became a great Whitlam weakness as well. Because if we look at Goff, okay, he um, had a tremendously, uh, tremendously successful 1969 election, won in 72, heroically was re-elected, in that campaign that I loved so much in 1974 and then was repudiated uh, utterly by the country in 1975 and 1977 when the prescriptions he put forward were seen as out of touch and obsolete. And you started to ask yourself, how could we have gone in such a small period of time to... Um, uh, having the Whitlam government, having, having, having Whitlam put forward an agenda which seemed to capture the imagination of the country and then a few years later being, being seen as obsolete. And, and Laura, um, this building on what Paul has said then, perhaps we could, do you think it's fair to take that even further from uh, policy ideas and commitment to, to, to really fundamental political uh, beliefs, what I think Paul talks about, a vision for the country. Uh, that, I don't think uh, that that is a real characteristic now of modern uh, politicians that they're really defined by their ideology, their ideas, their, their fundamental political beliefs. N very few people would be in very much doubt about what Gough Whitlam stood for if they had an interest in Australian politics. And it strikes me, I don't know whether this is fair or not, but it strikes me that's very different to the, situa the situation we have in more modern Australia. Well, it is very different and I think it's partly, certainly, <clears throat> sorry, partly um, during my time in um, Canberra, which goes back to the 80s, um, if you think about it, it's, there's been a sort of a, a self-absorption a lot of the time in the question of reforming government, sort of 
sort of undoing government would be one way of putting it. Uh, and then there's been this sort of extra layer put on of, about national security. It's been about doing stuff rather than taking us anywhere. And um, that's, that's sort of a lot of that's been driven by sort of external forces, um, partly because we did globalise, I think, partly because um, people then saw an opportunity, in, if, if you like, with terror, that's, that's a, you know, a crass way of putting it, but um, that all of these forces were about changing the way you did government. It wasn't necessarily about what you were trying to do as a country, necessarily. You know, the very, very, I can't think of many um, moments in national politics in the last 30 years where people have really sort of aspired to change the discussion about the nature of the country. And, and Paul, to your, to your list of Whitlam characteristics, uh, I, w I would only add um, a couple. I think courage is absolutely critical, uh, particularly in relation to uh, his uh, efforts in reforming the Labor Party, so organisationally courage. And if we're really being frank, uh, a bit of luck. For example, when he um, uh, called the, um, the federal executive uh, in uh, 1966, the 12 witless men, well, they were all men, but they didn't appreciate being called witless, that's for sure. It's just because, and I was saying this to Tony Whitlam a little earlier today, George Shaw, the country party member for Dawson, falls off the twig and as a result of that, there's a by-election in that seat. Gough campaigns in the seat. Labor wins a seat with a very significant swing. Everyone knows it's Gough's victory. It means two votes are changed at the federal executive of the Labor Party and the move to expel him, who knows what the consequences would have been if it had been successful. Um, uh, the move to expel him was was not successful because of two Queensland uh, um, delegates switching votes um, in the uh, euphoria in Queensland after the victory in Dawson. There's a bit of luck in this too, but there's a lot of courage, isn't there? Oh, there certainly is a lot of courage, uh, John. Um, and sometimes that courage is well-based and sometimes it's foolhardy. Um, we all know Goff had a crash through or crash approach uh, to government and sometimes this could be effective and sometimes it was most ineffective. And of course it took a long time for him to bring the Labor Party with him and there were a lot of uh, dramas along the way, in particular when he resigned and recontested the leadership against Jim Cairns and won a fairly, a fairly close contest, 38 to 32 votes. Uh, so you had a very significant section of the caucus at that point wanted to liquidate Whitlam. So this all wasn't, uh, it all wasn't uh, sweetness and light. Uh, I think that Whitlam had, and I've written this many times, what I call the great man theory of history. He saw himself as a leader, he saw himself as a figure of destiny, and that's why he adopted many of these approaches. And that's why he was prepared to gamble from time to time and put everything on the table. It's most interesting, I think, I think he influenced Malcolm Fraser, his principal opponent. Fraser also, I think, had what I would call the great man theory of history as well, which led to a lot of the, uh, which led to a lot of the dynamics we saw in 1975. Now, having the great man theory of history can be good on some occasions and it can be pretty disastrous on other occasions. And I think later on, of course, we saw subsequent Labor leaders thinking through their approach to leadership and perhaps having a more nuanced and less dynamic and less exciting approach than Goff, but perhaps an approach that worked better in terms of longevity. 
And, and just finally to you, Laura, before we open up to the floor, because many of these issues we've been speaking about um, over the course of today's symposium, but uh, one thing that also strikes me in terms of um, um, a, a, a comparison uh, between uh, the period of Gough's leadership, particularly after the Haradine affair, and um, and he, he contests... Um, well, he resigns and recontests and has that very close victory over Cairns in, in 1968. Um, uh, after, after that occurs and uh, in the, then the lead up to the uh, 69 election and beyond, broadly he starts to build really um, uh, significant support um, in, in the Labor Party and I think a big difference, it, it, this is my own personal experience of the time, a big difference between those years and what I've lived through since is the, the, his incredible capacity to motivate and inspire uh, the membership. He, he, he motivates and inspires the membership and it's fair to say also he motivates and inspires the vast majority of the party at an organisational level and, of course, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the federal parliamentary party. And there was the sort of energy and optimism in those years before the 1972 election that uh, uh, certainly, I'm certain, um, hasn't occurred uh, at any other time in, in my lifetime and I suspect really not for a century. And, did, uh, and isn't that a missing ingredient of current politics too? Uh, well, it's it's missing ingredient of um, sort of being able to inspire the collective, which you'd sort of think politics is actually supposed to be about. I mean, but, I mean, uh, you know, on the other side of politics, just as an example, um, just in a sort of an organisational way, Scott Morrison hadn't met quite a lot of his MPs, you know. He, he never spoke to them. They're lucky. <laughs> I really shouldn't have said that, should I? But it's like going back ten years and becoming a senator again. <laughs> so I'll just move right along. But, but it, 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 I mean, you don't sort of really get that sort of sense of... Uh, even caucus kumbaya too much, but certainly you don't get a sense of um, many Labor leaders really sort of going, okay, you know, the party faithful. I've got to, I've got to really work them. How do I, how do I inspire the party faithful? What, what do we do about that? I mean, you know, there's talk about reforming branch meetings and all those things, but that idea that there is this group of people that really, you know, be good to have on board um, seems to have disappeared. I think. Uh, so I think you're probably right. I don't remember it before that. Well, I'd like to add a quick postscript, John. Um, I think Whitlam did inspire. There's no doubt he did inspire the party. But I felt over time watching Goff that Goff was a loner. And Goff had a lot of supporters. There are a lot of people with him. He didn't so much have followers. Um, he, his personality and disposition... Uh, did not uh, encourage uh, unqualified loyalty. He was, I think, by his nature, very much a loner. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I think, but I think on the other hand, what he wins is respect and and an acceptance and understanding that what he was doing was in the interests, including the electoral interest of the Labor Party, and that grew quite dramatically after 68, I think it's fair to say. Can, can I... Um, this is more almost a question. Um, I think about Albo now and um, one point I've made to people um, on numerous occasions before he became Prime Minister as well as subsequently is he is a parliamentarian, as I think is Tony Burke. He's probably the last of the parliamentarians on Labor's side. Um, I think he ran the Gillard Parliament largely. Um, and uh, I suppose an interesting reflection, because I think, I think you might have mentioned, um, Paul, that, um, or, or John, I'm not sure, that 
that Gough was a parliamentarian, but um, I'm not quite sure how well he worked as running his cabinet, um, which was a bit of a challenge to start with. But it's interesting just to reflect on those, if, if you're t talking about those group dynamics, it's sort of interesting to reflect on how he, re he ran those day-to-day -day groups that he really had to have the numbers with and who had to really be backing him compared to more modern uh, political leaders. Just quickly on that point, um, there are two things that Gough was not able to achieve before he became Prime Minister, and that was the government was saddled with a cumbersome, hopeless, 27-man cabinet, which was totally ineffective as a decision-making body. And, of course, the subsequent um, Hawke government learnt from that. And secondly, the practice still prevailed that caucus could overrule cabinet decisions. That meant the politics of the caucus during the Whitlam government were really critical. It was tremendous fun covering the caucus because the stakes were so high. And, of course, a lot of the caucus uh, MPs were very motivated by the idea that they could overturn cabinet decisions. That is not a good practice in governance. And, again, that was subsequently corrected. Yeah, I, I don't think there was, uh, there's been anyone who has used um, the parliament the way Gough Whitlam did. And Daryl Mellum, in fact, a little earlier today, uh, indicated he was still using the parliament for questions on notice via Daryl, via Robert McClelland, uh, via Colin Hollis. And, and, and uh, this, of course, became really critical as, um, as in the development of... Um, the uh, the Whitlam the Whitlam program uh, uh, for government. The w the one thing I would say about that, Laura, is um, that the perhaps the 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 big difference uh, between uh, uh, Goff and so many of those who followed him is one of one of um, Paul's point in terms of being a visionary. Having a, a real, a really well-developed vision for the nation, being willing to advocate in support of that vision for really an entire parliamentary career. I mean, he's very consistent in in relation to it, inside the parliament, outside uh, the parliament. As I say, I think people did understand what Gough Whitlam's broad vision for the nation was, and I think in my uh, lifetime in, in politics, the only federal leader that has come close to that or leader that's come close to that is probably Paul Keating, to be fair. Because, again, whether people agreed with um, uh, Paul or um, had fundamental disagreements with him, I think there was a broad understanding about his uh, agenda for, for the nation. Anyway, there's some perspectives from us, uh, friends, and... Uh, I'm pleased to open it up for some of uh, your views or, or questions. Jeff, start with you. I'll just throw a, throw a question to the panel. Introduced us to the idea that certain things may be historically inevitable. Was it historically inevitable that someone like Gough Whitlam with his intellect, his a little bit of self-belief, a little bit, uh, and... Uh, you know, he, his commitment to the Labor cause, I mean, he, he did inspire the rank and file, no question. He was an egalitarian and people of the Labor uh, side, you know, that's basically one of the things they're about. But given his personality and all of those things and his stubbornness in many ways in, in respect of taking advice and whatever because he knew more than others, was his defeat inevitable? Well, I think it probably was inevitable <laughs> given a few things. One was the global and domestic economic environment at the time, which was incredibly challenging. Uh, the second was the um, binary nature of the government. I mean, it was a modern government and an old-fashioned government simultaneously, and it was plagued by very severe internal divisions. And finally, it was subject to sabotage by the coalition through the Senate. And that process began at a very early stage of the government 
and it was really important in weakening and demoralising the government. If I look at those three elements, then I'd say the result was inevitable. Could it be avoided? It? Could it be avoided? It? Perhaps, but that would have been asking an awful lot. Have you got a view, Laura, on whether um, electoral success is ever inevitable or electoral failure? It's a toughie. <laughs> yeah, well, I think Jeff's question in, in a way goes to, you know, if you put all of those other factors aside, was the, was the Gough personality ultimately doomed to failure? I, look, I, um, I've just been listening to your podcast about Horatio Nelson um, and, I, I mean, it, it, there's, there's, you know, you, 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 do, was he always going to crash and burn if he didn't have all of these other things? Uh, I, I don't know that you can really say that. Um, have we had somebody else who, who sort of? I, mean, I think we've all been agreeing that golf, golf was a once-off. Um, but there is sort of a certain arc in our politics, which it seems to suggest, even at a moment, you know, of immense success. You know, we, that everybody tends to end up flying a little bit too close to the sun. But that's a fairly unprofound remark, so I'll just shut up now. Thank you both for your, your comments. I think they're very, very interesting. I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments about the It's Time advertising campaign. Uh, I was 17 when he was elected and was very actively involved at a local level in, in promoting him. Uh, but... As a serial campaign survivor, I've got to say that I think the It's Time campaign was really a gold standard for Australian political campaigning. Uh, why? Because bef never before had a political campaign in Australia acted in, a, in the way in which it did. It took a, it, it, it ceased just being a series of local campaigns and unified them under under the title It's Time, which obviously resonates after 23 years when you've got a figure like Whitlam and so forth. And also involved not just television, but you know, obviously the fantastic It's Time Choir, which was on our TV screens every night. Uh, you know, it was in black and white, but I remember it in colour. And it was combined with uh, radio and print. And that was all coordinated through uh, McCann Erickson and Mick Young and his team. And I think we've been talking about a lot of the finer detail of election, uh, of the Whitlam years and assuming that people know a lot about what was going on at the time. But for many people, the first real hint of excitement about change came with the advertising campaign and the things that went with it. I mean, I remember you couldn't do it today, although I was once in a campaign in Greece where they did it, where you would go at, to campaign events which would go for four or more hours in the night. I remember going to one in North, North Brisbane where, you know, the local member spoke, the mayor spoke, the deputy premier spoke, <laughs> or the deputy opposition leader spoke, and finally, after everyone had gone out and had a smoke and a drink, at the back, golf came on. And... He did that right across the country. I mean, Caldwell did it before him, but and, and I'm sure there were plenty of leaders that did that, but th this was the point, I think, where we were transitioning from that old style of campaigning, which really was heavily built around crowds and getting people out, to, a, to what was frankly a more sophisticated method of, of, of getting a message across which told the same story to the entire country, which as we know as political campaigners is a very important thing to do. Now, I, I lived in the seat of Griffith in Brisbane and across the country every campaign uh, had the its time package of materials, the, you know, the posters and so forth, except in the seat of Griffith where the candidate was a fellow called Eddie Fote and Eddie refused to have anything to do with the It's Time campaign, even though Griffith was a, a very winnable seat, uh, because he was going to campaign on the theme of don't miss the boat, vote vote. And <laughs> because <laughs> the only person that did miss the boat was Eddie. Uh, but it, in, in a sense that really jarred because everywhere else they... It, it, it was a campaign that everyone, where, where everyone was could sing the, uh, the It's Time theme, couldn't they, Patricia? And, uh, and, 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 it, and 
And it was the first opportunity for a lot of people to get a sense of the excitement about electing a government that was new and change, you know, and was going to be transformative. It, it, and I think that we should never underestimate the importance of that advertising campaign and everything that went around it. Uh, it, well, it was pretty. It was. It was very. I, I think. I think the point I was. And it just, set a, a mark, you know, for future campaigns. Oh yeah, and I, I suppose what I was getting at was it. You know, it did set um, a standard, and uh, it set an expectation, which um, I, I, th I mean, I think you know everybody would wait to see what the slogan was on a, a campaign in the eighties and nineties. I don't think they don't worry about it quite so much now, but everybody and you'd look at it and you go, "Is that it?" You know, so it, it was, I think, when, when I talk about that half-life of 1972, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. But if you think about the implications of that, you know, the, the, the focus on the leader, you know, of, of the overwhelming focus on the leader now, um, the focus on the national campaign and the simplification of the message, in some ways, I'm, I'm not blaming Goff for this, but it's like, because it's happened everywhere, but it, it's it's the way it's moved so that, you know, nobody does want to sit through four hours of listening to the mayor and the deputy leader of the opposition and stuff. And in part, this is a chicken and egg question. Does the It's Time campaign engender and create energy in th and enthusiasm or really does it reflect the energy and enthusiasm that uh, Goff... Uh, and uh, and the party's campaign has developed over a period of time. It's a, it's probably one we don't. Well, it's a bit of both, I suspect. Uh, I spent more time working for the party's advertising agency than I did for Goff, and I've been a student of advertising campaigns. I wasn't around for this one. Uh, and I, to Laura's point, I can only remember one other slogan in all the time since. And that was Rand's Our Man, and that was set to a tune uh, as its time was. Uh, the, the point about the campaign slogan is it, it was an undeniable proposition. You know, 23 years, whoever came up with those words absolutely nailed it. And you didn't need to do anything more than that in the campaign. And, it, you know, everything else including the television commercials, the song and so forth, just encapsulated those couple of words. And I would attribute a huge amount of the success in 72, which we've spoken about earlier today, as not being as overwhelming as some of us might remember it. It was a pretty close-cut thing. I would attribute an awful lot of it to that, that simple slogan. Murray. My recollection is that ANOP showed, a, over the campaign period, showed a steady and steep decline in Labor support in 72. Morgan showed an equally steep and steady increase in Labor support, to which the response of some people was, Roy Morgan has realised Labor's going to win and has to do something about this to bring his poll into line. And the third poll, I think, would have been Solwick, maybe only in Melbourne and Sydney, and it pretty well flatlined. That doesn't help us a lot, uh, Murray. <laughs> it shows, well, it does show that it's far from clear. That yeah, no, I, that's the, that, that was sort of what I was trying to say, <laughs> in, in, in an amusing aside. <laughs> Who's next? Leanne. Thank you all. Um, it's wonderful to hear your thoughts. Um, I had a question for you going to what you said earlier, John, about um, the importance of policy preparedness, consultation, the policy program the Whitlam government had. And I've been thinking um, one of the refreshing things about the current federal government in my experience so far of engaging with a couple of different portfolio ministers is a depth of policy knowledge um, and preparedness. So my question was whether um, any of you see any parallels um, with this government having lost the previous two elections ago with a whole lot of policies, maybe some people said too many policies, and the time they had to flesh those out between the previous election and this one in terms of how they're, how they're leading on some big national issues, I think, now. Um, I had a, quite an interesting conversation with a very old-timer coalition figure 
um, about a week ago, who is not in the parliament anymore but has been around for a very long time, who made the observation that he was struck by the fact that it was the most experienced government that he had that he could remember. And it was sort of funny because I thought, oh, well, actually, that's probably right. Um, and, you know, there are some people who've been ministers before, uh, but there are also people who'd done a lot of that portfolio work. Now, they were all pretty cautious, um, but I think that the interesting thing to me about what's happening now um, is that they're confident enough about the policy that they might not have drawn out a lot of policy. Every so often they surprise me by coming out with, like they seem to have done a bit more work on the Integrity Commission than I thought they had, for example, though it's not perfect. Um, but um, they've got the confidence that they're prepared to let a debate run, which is a real thing, particularly for journalists. <laughs> Hooray! Um, that, uh, and and uh, the Prime Minister says this himself quite a lot, whether it's um, uh, the voice... Um, there's a couple of other things I can't think of at the moment, but he, he says, let, let people talk about it. I'm not going to come in and prescribe. Now, s some people are cynical about why he's doing that, but that reflects, and, and, it, and it reflects it reflected his approach, you know, where everybody was saying, okay, you know, come on, Albo, you know, are you, when are you going to actually make a move during the election campaign? And he held his ground for all of that time. Um, that that reflects a confidence which I think is sh and, he, and he's prepared to let his uh, colleagues run their own races. So I think I think that's interesting. I I, I can't compare it with with Goff because I I just wasn't there. But um, but I think it certainly reminds me of um, you know that they might not be as uh, you know st startlingly brilliant as the early Hawke cabinet, but you know that there is that. Sort of, they are interested in policy, which after the last ten years, frankly, is, you know, quite a plus. So uh, I'll give Rodney the call. This is either going to be the last, depending on what he asks, or second last question because I'm getting the wind up, uh, and we'll get you a mic, uh, Rodney, which is coming up behind you. Well, well no, no, don't use Paul's. He he might want to respond to you. Everything that says about golf engendering enthusiasm, devotion and also love is true. But if you take the story below to the branches, local campaigns, candidates running, and I cite just one example where I lived in the electorate of Benelong, held by Sir John Cramer since 1949. Six weeks out from the 2nd of December... You don't need a microphone, Rodney. <laughs> You're hearing too much. Six weeks out from the 2nd of December. Rodney, Rodney, you've been asked to lower the microphone. Oh, I see. Six weeks out from the 2nd of December, in all of the shopping centres of Benelong, and I mean by that Fig Tree, Hunters Hill, Glazel Shops, North Ride, East Ride, Lane Cove, Lane Cove West, Chatswood, there would be up to a dozen people. The people who were there six weeks out would be have more people five weeks out, more again, until you had a virtual army coming together who would then be staffing the polling booths. And I'm sure there's other people who can talk about what was objectively a hopeless seat where there was this level of enthusiasm, which continued. I was saying last weekend when there was a conference misnamed the annual conference of the ALP, which takes place every four years or so, that between 1971 and 1975, when I was the president of the Benelong Federal Electric Council, we met for 12 months of the year, that included January, and every meeting went from 8pm 8, 8 to 10.30, with extension of time at 10 every meeting, and we didn't get through all the business. That I put down to what Whitlam engendered in the way of self-confidence and a feeling that everything we did mattered. I suggest to you that is not the position today. Luck. Goff, if the Whitlam government had been elected in 1969 with the tax revenues that were coming in from the minerals boom, we would have had an age of wonders. The money that was available to Howard and Costello 
with the second mining boom after 1996, which carried through to Rudd and was squandered in tax cuts, including the last, which was squandered by Rudd. It brings up a theme that Kim Williams was talking about and the other speakers earlier. The great tradition Gough created in the arts, a passionate commitment to them, which is a tradition that's carried on or simultaneous by Don Dunstan, Bob Carr, John Bannon, John Kane, Paul Keating, is completely lost. When it came to engendering jobs and uh, economic activity in 2007, not a thought was given to the arts, contrasted to the New Deal and FDR, where money was poured into the arts in a big way. Some of it was quite brilliant, like getting college students to go into the Adirondacks and the hills of Tennessee and talk to people about their lives. So you had all sorts of things happening at once. The enrichment of the students and these stories recorded forever. There was no thought about that in Rudd Gillard Rudd. For the first time, a Labor government fell because it deserved to. It was the worst government post-war and I'm prepared to argue that in any forum. As bad as Morrison was, he never got as bad as those two. But <laughs> one thing I can agree with that Rodney has said is about the Benelong FEC and its meetings, not because I was a delegate or even in Benelong, merely because I know Rodney wrote very, very long and copious reports of every, all those meetings and showed all those reports to me. <laughs> it, it, it was like reading a 50-page you know, um, volume after every meeting. But uh, because, because of the uh, length of that um, uh, uh, comment from, uh, or editorial from Rodney, <laughs> Uh, that, that will be our, our, um, our last contribution, apart from me asking, uh, first of all, Paul, if you have any uh, final comments to make after that. Well, I just think it's terrific that um, we're now focusing on uh, Gough Whitlam and the Whitlam government as all these uh, anniversaries come up. So I'm anticipating over the next few years that we have plenty of fruitful, uh, interesting and contentious debates about the Whitlam legacy. Thanks, Paul. And anything from you finally, Laura? Oh, well, yeah, it's great to be celebrating the, the Whitlam government rather than um, its demise. Uh, or no, not <laughs> celebrating its demise, you know what I mean. Um, and um, it's, I suppose, my experience is that I'm struck often by how um, the Whitlam government sort of rears up in something I'm doing um, uh, in an unexpected way. I was looking for some, um, for some particular piece of legislation about Malcolm Fraser and, you know, I'm a dummy, but I didn't know the extent to which Malcolm actually went on to implement so much of Gough's agenda. And um, I think that is one of the really interesting and largely unknown to the general public stories now because it does show the capacity for both sides of politics um, to actually get the idea of transforming a country on an area like Aboriginal land rights and moving ahead with it even, even after the tumultuous events of 1975. Yeah, thanks, Laura. And just to follow on from that, I think it's also fair to say that um, after all the criticism of the Whitlam government's economic uh, management from um, Malcolm and his team into the lead up to the 1975 election, they didn't touch Bill Hayden's budget uh, subsequently. So having said that, uh, just uh, sincere thanks to uh, both Paul and Laura uh, on behalf, uh, personally, and also on behalf of the uh, Institute um, and uh, all present, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a terrific thing to have two such eminent Australian journalists and writers with us. We all appreciate it very sincerely. Thank you very much. We have uh, um, two speakers, Swap Dick, Senegavarapu and Charlie Joyce, who will join us at the front to offer some concluding remarks and reflections on the day. I would add that Swapnik 
and Charlie, together with Henri Vickers, who's also here, are editing a book on Whitlam entitled Contemporary Relevance, which consists of the voices of their contemporaries. Thank you so much, John. Um, it's very humbling to be following such an eminent panel. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, I'd like to begin with some brief acknowledgements. Um, firstly, like everyone else, to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on whose lands which we sit, for the Whitlam Institute for organising today's fantastic symposium, um, for supporting our work and particularly for giving us the honour of closing today's uh, events. Um, to all the day's speakers, and as well as to Frank Bongiorno, Emma Colpert and Jenny Hocking, whose papers were terrific impetus for today's discussions. Um, and then also to the many brilliant young writers contributing to that project who, while not in this room, are uh, indicative of the Whitlam government's um, enduring legacy and, dare I say, contemporary relevance. And finally, that Swap and I come to this symposium um, from a new generation. Both of us are born in the new millennium um, and our generation inherits the Whitlam legacy and must carry forward both its memory and its spirit. Um, in the novel Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, American writer and journalist Hunter S. Thompson uh, described his protagonist, Raoul Duke, reflecting on the 1960s counterculture. Um, he says, we had all the momentum. We were riding the crest of a high and beautiful wave. Now, less than five years later, you can go up to a steep hill in Las Vegas and look west. And with the right kind of eyes, you can almost see the high watermark, that place where the wave finally broke and rolled back. Um, the Whitlam government certainly represents the high watermark of Australian social democratic progress. In the words of Kim Williams, um, it is the shining standard of reform. But as this symposium is so compellingly laid out, the Whitlam government did not merely ride the wave of mid-century social change. On the contrary, its ascendancy was a matter of conscious protagonistic politics. From the, far from the inevitable, the Whitlam government was a monumental political achievement. This has been a deeply important acknowledgement from today's symposium, and it's one that I think inspires. Um, if we recognise the Whitlam government as a political achievement, we can begin to see it, in the words of a previous speaker, as a testament to the possibilities in Australian politics. As today's speakers have argued, many of today's progressive reformers are carrying a baton handed to them by the Whitlam government's legacy. As Senator Dodson, um, his wonderful remarks demonstrated today's campaigns for Indigenous recognition, for voice and for Makarata carry on the victories of land rights and self-determination. Um, but it must also be acknowledged that our society has not continued Williams' reformist path towards, as Jeff Gallup said, um, a democratic socialist horizon. Inequality in education, health, housing, gender relations continues and grows. We face a poly crisis of economics, demographics, climate and ecology. And this, demo this demonstrates the contemporary relevance of Whitlam's legacy. A new generation must rediscover um, this political spirit, I think, and, and carry it forward. And, and in a sense, our project, uh a book of essays on selected topics related to the Whitlam in, uh, related to the Whitlam legacy and their contemporary relevance today by contributors under the age of twenty four so seeks to take up the call that that Charlie has put to us. In a sense, we are very much forward thinking. It's hard to reminisce about the Whitlam legacy uh, when you were born thirty five years after it, uh, but. Nonetheless, our project in a way is to construct a Whitlamism without Whitlam. If, as Charlie says, contingency in politics were important to the Whitlam victory and it wasn't just determinism and uh, there were some accusations of Whiggish history today that we don't hope to re replicate at all, uh, we think that taking up social democracy and progress for the 21st century requires generating lessons and knowledge from how Whitlam came to power and applying them to our contemporary situation. Uh, often we talk about rules of threes, uh, 
John Menadieu's triad has been spoken about today. But uh, for us, there were three pillars of uh, the Whitlam legacy that we should pick up today. The first is a motivated pragmatism. Um, particularly Whitlam demonstrated this on his, his views towards the constitution and the ALP socialist objective and innovating those to their within the limits of the Australian constitution and, and picking them up for their contemporary uh, modern requirements. But secondly, and beyond just pragmatism, there must be majoritarian coalition building. We heard a lot today about how Whitlam came to power, not just through, you know, that historical subject of social democracy, the organised working class, but also through the social movements of his time, through uh, an enlightened middle class that was looking for a political outlet to break free from the stifling conservatism of the previous years. And something similar is required today, both to win, and we saw Albanese win on a very innovative and new coalition, but also to sustain the project into the future because the reproduction and replication of social democracy is in some sense contingent on the coalition that brings it to power. And finally, this last one speaks for itself, but zealous reform is really at the, the heart of the Whitlam legacy. And, and we hope that our contribution, however small it might be, picks up on these themes and pushes them into the future and, and is forward-looking in a sense. Thank you, uh, Swapnik and Charlie, and also Henry. Henry, where are you? Back there, the, uh, the three editors of this uh, fascinating new book, Contemporary Relevance. And uh, um, I, uh, um, uh, you made reference again to the, the, the pithy catch cry, uh, party, policy, and people. So that now for a uh, contemporary audience might be now, to quote you, uh, Swapnik, pragmatism motivated by democratic socialism, comma, <laughs> Majoritarian coalition building and zealous reform. I uh, thank you for that, and I really look forward to your your output. and uh, uh, And hopefully, at one of the future symp uh, symposiums, we'll be proud to launch that. But uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, for sharing your thoughts on the day. Thank you. Thanks, well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, that was a very quick day. Um, the uh, uh, the addresses and the questioning from the floor and the comments from the floor were exhilarating uh, right from the start. And I thank you everyone who uh, was able to stay for the entire day. It was uh, a wonderful day. As the Honorable John Faulkner mentioned this morning, this is the first of our 50th anniversary events. In Sydney, we will be holding an oration on the 13th of November at Bowman Hall at the Blacktown Civic Center. We are very honored to have the Foreign Minister, Senator the Honorable Penny Wong, to speak uh, at that event to deliver the oration. 50 years to the day of the It's Time 1972 labor, po uh, labor Policy launch. If you would like further information on this oration, please leave your name, email, telephone number, uh, details with one of our Whitlam staff uh, members here today at the regi uh, registration desk and uh, standing over there as well. Oh, and thank you, Amita and Ran, for uh, um, um, uh, all the, uh, the microphone carrying today. I think it's, uh, um, I hope you get running shoes next time um, <laughs> to get around the room. Um, our plan is to deliver a one-day symposium each year focusing on different elements of the Whitlam legacy. The following uh, events will be held in different cities uh, with a particular focus on Canberra and Melbourne. Now, we will also be holding a series of legally focused fora uh, for, uh, to, to, to reflect on the major transformations to the Australian legal landscape engineered by the Whitlam government. The first of these events will take place in court one in the federal court building at Queen's Square in Sydney on the 17th of February 2000, uh, sorry, 2023. So put that in your calendars now, please. That will focus on the Legal Aid Commission and 
have two panels, one focusing on indigenous rights and the second on family and domestic violence. We are very proud that this series will be opened by the Attorney General, the Honorable Mark Dreyfus, KCMP, and also Anne-Marie Lumsden, who is the Director of the Northern Territory Legal Aid Commission. Um, I've been working with Anne-Marie quite uh, close the last few uh, week or two, and we have two very exciting panels to offer. We will also be launching a new uh, exhibition called An Agenda for Change, curated by the brilliant Guy Betts, which will be on display at the Female Orphan School from late November 2022 to April 2023, before it then inevitably goes on the road. Please check the uh, Institute's website for more details on opening days and times. We, of course, will communicate to you through our newsletter and uh, social media. In conclusion, I would like to uh, thank a number of people who are integral to this day and the launch of this symposium. Uh, not here today uh, in the room, but Danny Gilbert of uh, Gilbert and Tobin uh, for lending us his space and supporting this institution, uh, both today and, in, uh, and for, the, for, for many years. And not only this institution, but of course, the university, Western Sydney University. I also wish to recognize a number of uh, Danny Gilbert's uh, colleagues, Rebecca Shaw and Adam Kuzmano, uh, who uh, uh, arranged uh, uh, the day's uh, particular events and catering and, uh, uh, and facilities in this room. Thank you very much to them as well. And uh, please accept our ov uh, overwhelming and sincere gratitude for all your support today and over the years. Now, um, in particular, I want to thank all of our speakers. And can I ask Amita and Rand to give some assistance here? Um, all of our speakers and presenters today gave us fascinating analysis and insights. And uh, not only were the papers uh, by Jenny and Frank uh, um, so, so brilliantly presented and then the responders uh, so energetically engaging, uh, the questioning from the floor was just uh, electric at times. And uh, it was a very, very fun day. Um, Frank and Jenny, your scene setting papers uh, and more broadly, um, uh, your endeavors to support the Winst uh, Whitlam Institute over the years as distinguished fellows of uh, the Institute uh, is without peer. And uh, I thank you so much for all that you've done to, uh, to launch this first mission with your wonderful papers. Thank you. Um, can I ask uh, maybe the, uh, some, a little token of gifts to all the speakers uh, who spoke today um, uh, to be handed out by uh, uh, Ran and Amita? This just by name, of course, Frank and Michelle and uh, Meredith Bergman, Jenny and Patrick Mullins and Rose Jackson. In session three, of course, the, the Senator, the Honorable Patrick Dodson, Hannah Forsyth, Emily Mullane, and of course, Kim Williams. And in the final sessions of the day, Paul Kelly, Laura Tingle, Charlie, Henry, and Spopnik. Thank you very much for all your contributions today. Um, um, they made the day go, um, it was a brilliant day, but so quickly. And uh, um, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, um, now at the end have a time to uh, relax and, the, and enjoy the reception, which is shortly to follow. But may I also now thank, uh, and very importantly, the 50th anniversary subcommittee uh, that has taken the, uh, the charge of organizing these events. Now that subcommittee is chaired by Kim Williams with the, Senate, uh, with the Honorator, uh, Honorable John Faulkner, Catherine Dovey, Patricia Amflit, and Senior Deputy Vice Chancellor Professor Claire Pollock, who's unfortunately not here today. But I also wish to uh, recognize and thank two past Institute directors who are here today as well. Leanne Smith, thank you very much. And at the back, Eric Sidoti, thank you so much. Finally, now, on behalf of the staff of the Whitlam Institute, for all the elements of preparation that have gone into making this uh, inaugural symposium a most intriguing program and a very enjoyable day, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you so much. It's uh, wonderful to have you as colleagues.
Thank you so much for coming and uh, see you at the next symposium. <laughs>